Again, I have. We'll just wait a few seconds here. See if people start popping on. Man, last night. <laughs> what a disaster, dude. I mean, it's funny. It's it's such a referendum on – like Matt LaFleur has been up for Coach of the Year, right? All year talking about what a great job he's doing and everything. And I know guys in the building, right? And Matt, and I'm saying Matt's a good coach. Mm-hmm. But it's like it's nuts like to think about the Green Bay Packers being the number one seed in the playoffs and having the worst special teams unit in the playoffs. It's like, how is that even possible? Or not in the playoffs, yeah. sorry, in the entire league. How can you be ranked 32nd in special teams? And it's and guys have been saying this to me since McCarthy was there. Like Aaron Rodgers is just so good that he just masks problems that mm-hmm. other teams would have to – like if you were a defensive football team that didn't have a – if you were the Niners, you'd have to hit that head on. Like, oh, we suck at special teams. Like we need to get a little bit better. We can't be last in the league. Mm-hmm. And – I mean, it just talking about getting slapped in the face last night. That was embarrassing. Yeah, that was man. It, it it just it's the same old Packers though. They always they tend to do this always in the playoffs. It's just you know the what same old you know story. what happens. It's it's what it seems like happens is they had like they always have a good first fifteen, mm-hmm. and then Lewis fumbles the ball, and there's a like. There's a couple of backup tight ends that are in the game in some critical plays, like running, like backside of runs that Lewis is usually in, and then like a couple of routes. And I know that Tunyon's been hurt, but there's just like these little detailed plays that just, you know, like they go from second and long to third and long instead of like third and four, you know, yep. missing, you know, losing yards on first down. And when you watch that game, the biggest thing that happened in that game was so Billy Turner comes back. He's the and we're going to be talking about lines. This is like a, this is a, I think a, a good example of like why it's so important in the playoffs. So Bakhtiari, if you think about it, Bakhtiari is probably their second best player like on the entire team. He's that good. Yeah. Sorry, maybe third after Devontae, right? But he hurts his leg in the practice last year. They essentially like I've argued that I'll argue that JPP beat them last year, the Bucks game. Like mm-hmm. Bakhtiari being out was probably why they lost because otherwise he doesn't get Aaron doesn't get touched. They go through the whole season here, and then sure enough, he he can't start this game. So they take Billy Turner, who's been a great right tackle. They put him at left and decide to leave Dennis Kelly in at right tackle, who's been a career backup for the Titans. And is like, yeah, by all accounts, is a, you know, plays hard and everything. He's a good dude. Yeah. But they had this guy, Josh Neisman, over at left tackle, a rookie, but he's been playing pretty well for the entire season. And then so they take him out. They put Billy in. Billy does a good job. But now you've got this guy named um, – this guy, Patrick, Lucas Patrick, who was playing back – he was our backup center. He was playing when Myers was hurt. They move him to right guard, and they let Kelly stay at, at right tackle. And Bosa beats the brakes off him. And, like, what you don't see with Aaron Rodgers' game is how many times he has to get flushed out of the pocket, how many times he's running for his life. And those mm-hmm. first reads aren't working. Unless it's, unless your name's Devontae Adams, like, you weren't winning. Zard wasn't winning. Like, MBS wasn't in the game, right? Equimunia St. Brown has to win all these routes. It's, it's just yeah. not going to happen. Well, San so Fran, just, they, I mean, they, they had him. Yeah. They had him. Yeah, they're just dumping good. check downs, man. And it just – it sucks because it feels like every year you go from – playing this really nice, like, balanced game. And and then it seemed really balanced in the first half. And then we, we got more towards, like, the five-step drops and scat yeah. protections, just things that they – it never turns out well unless you have multiple guys winning on routes, and they just they didn't have it yesterday. Well, they had a good game plan, San Fran, with doubling Devontae and having guy over the top. That that really helped them. And I don't, I don't know why teams aren't doing that more. I mean, that guy is something else. They do, no, they, but they, they honestly, they, they do, and he still got his in the first half. But then well, those other guys know, weren't winning. That's yeah, the they're just not winning. Like usually, Lazard's had a monster season. MVS was hurt, but he's had a good season. And mm-hmm. then Dylan gets hurt, and you know he was kind of we. I think Packer fans were kind of going like, "Oh man, I can't wait to it to get cold." And AJ Dillon's running the ball in the third and fourth quarter. And Aaron Jones is a stud, like he can't play every snap. And AJ Dillon's 250 pounds, like it's just a different conversation. So when you're not running, or excuse me, when you're not completing passes to Lazard, Mercedes Lewis isn't isn't you're getting a lot of touches. Then all of a sudden, or Randall Cobb's not getting a lot of touches. All of a sudden, you have two guys that can go downhill and just end the game for you. And we just palms yeah. up, man. It's, it was unbelievable. 
Yeah, they're both were both both really good games yesterday. Low scoring. Yeah. Um, but let's let's get into let's get into talk about offense alignment here. We kind of discussed it a little bit, but why we're here today. Um, we got former Panthers Pro Bowler and All Pro guard Mike Wall. We've had we've had him on. I think it was in December we had you on our um, first time on the show, and we're really glad to have you back. Um, I just want to start off um, talking about the process to perform, uh, what what you run, and kind of just give us a breakdown. I know you talked about it on our podcast a little bit, but um, just the keys and what really got you started in that, why you're so passionate about it. Yeah, Fab, thanks for having me on again. So process to perform is, is really my answer to the problem that athletes face as far as you know, when I was in the professional ranks as a player, as a coach, as a performance specialist, as a consultant, I just keep saying the same things over and over at the, at the highest level. And it's a lot of these athletes show up that are good athletes. They're, you know, they're, they're hungry. They have, they have all have different backgrounds, but a lot of them just don't have the tool set to be successful, tool set to be elite. And for, mm-hmm. for me, that's, that's mindset development, technical mastery and ownership decisions. Nobody's teaching these, these athletes these things anymore. It's a whole different generation of people growing of, of, of young people growing up and how we're sorry, my, my camera goes in and out. Sorry about that. But a whole generation of young people going, uh, growing up and, and we're not giving them this tool set to be successful, right? They're, they're spending a lot of times on their phone, face-to-face conversations are different. Access to information is different. The way they brand themselves is different. And so I wanted to create a, a, a total athlete development platform that really helped pros all the way down to 12, 13 year olds, discover and learn the process of becoming the best version of themselves using those three themes. And um, we do it through our our platform, our our one-on-one, our hands-on platform. We do it through coaching development. And then of course we do it through the process to perform player development podcast, which is available anywhere you get your podcasts. And uh, it's been a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun being able to help kind of at all levels. Like I said, I work from pros down to preteens and now we're getting into the, the coaching side of it and really helping coaches build out their platform, build out their, their organization, make sure their culture's right. And, and really Matt Rule giving you a call? athletes. <laughs> has, Matt Rule give, has Matt Rule given you a call? No, nah, man, I guess I'm not on that. I'm not on that red bat phone yet. Maybe uh, someday. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Um, well, today we're breaking down Brady Christensen. Panthers drafted him out of BYU in the third round this past season. A lot of fans really wanted to see him start uh, week one over Cam Irving. Um, and at tackle? Yeah, at tackle. And he, yeah. he really didn't get an opportunity. He was really all over the place. He was playing guard. They had him on the right side. I think he played left guard at some point, uh, filling in for injuries. Then they finally put him in at left tackle the last three games of the season. And really because Cam Irving – was getting hurt as well. So, um, but he got pushed into the mix in the starting role week 16 through 18. And he really, he played pretty well um, for those couple games. I would say, I think he, I mean, you couldn't get much worse with what Carolina was dealing with on the offensive line, but I thought he held his own and I just kind of wanted to bring you in here. I cut up some um, tape off of the uh, NFL game pass online, the all 22, just to kind of get, to see what, you know, what Brady's progression was from Tampa Bay to the Saints game. And then he got a second shot at Tampa Bay to see how he improved in those three games. Um, the, other, the talk, even from the coach, has been that his arm length. And I know me and you, we, I asked you about it, and I, I went back to that podcast, and you said right, it's man. nonsense. And there's some coaches that firmly believe that – you know, these tackles need 34 inch arms or longer and Brady's, I mean, he's 32 and a fourth. So look, I I was friends with John Ogden and like, Mm -hmm. I remember, I'll never forget. We used to work out in Vegas, right? We didn't work out together because he would golf when I was having to work out because he was six foot nine with his Afro and and has like 37 inch arms. And I would be like, dude, what's the deal, man? Like how much do you bench? And he goes, what does it matter? And he just, he, he comes, he basically is like across the room and he reaches out and like touches my nose with his fingers. And I'm, you know, I'm over here like T-Rex. So it's not that it doesn't help, but in today's game with the athletes, it, Jonathan Ogden had great footwork too. Like that's what separated him. And, and footwork separates these athletes arm length, unless it's like a huge anomaly, as far as they're really, really like T-Rex short. Mm-hmm. Um, it really comes down to like, are, do you, 
do you live in the right body position? Do you live in a hip hinge body position so that you're not giving up your chest every time? Do you have good of initial footwork to put yourself in a position to be successful? Like, do you get to your real spot, real estate spot under control? If the answer to those things is yes, then you're going to be able to find a way to have success, right? And then just understanding how to watch tape and understanding tendencies and keeping your opponent off rhythm and whatnot. It's, it's, it's like such an easy answer to say, I'm going to cut the herd here. But that's not – otherwise, you like otherwise, if that's the case, you shouldn't have drafted him. That doesn't make any sense. Yeah. No, I got you. I got you. Well, why don't we – why don't we look at some of this tape here um, and just kind of – I want to get a sense what you, what you see when you're watching tape. Because right. for a fan like me, I'm watching it. I don't know as much, obviously, as – really, I'm not an expert in this at all. But just from what I see compared to what you see – um, as a former player, I think it would be good for the fans just to see what Bra what has Brady's done and what what do you kind of look for when you're looking at that. So let me okay. pull up here. Um, so this is the this first game they uh, the all 22 they didn't have the end zone look so I not a lot of play so I had to pull from the actual game itself and then okay. um, some sideline shots as well. So we'll just kind of look and. When you want me to pause or anything like that, just let me know. Sure. <clears throat> do you want to? Do you want to tell me what you what you see first? Or you want me to? You want me to tell you? No, you fire away. Okay. So the first thing is, I'd start with a stance. And it, so everybody's got a different stagger, right? And the reason that we, you know, what a stagger is. So the stagger is like where your feet are positioned to the, compared to the the other person. Yeah. You just want yep. to stop it. And make, so we just talk about this for a sec, right? The, the, the deeper your stagger, what you're really doing is like mechanically from a spatial situation, you're moving your hips back. So imagine if my stagger is like flat like this, my hips are right underneath me. Okay. Yep. And you can see he's got this. Now, one thing about Brady, I've watched, you know, maybe a quarter of a game on him before. Like he just sat there and watched. His stance changes all the time. And sometimes he sits taller than he should. Like his natural default state is more standing up than, than hip yeah. pinch. That's, that's, you just have to get comfortable being uncomfortable. It's something he's going to have to learn. Uh -huh. But the bigger stagger you have, your hips are further back. So you're already kind of where you want to get to from a real estate spot. You're that much closer to kind of where you want to get to. Because, again, the key in, in, in pass protection confrontation is I want to get to my real estate spot under control before you get there. That's the number one thing. Can I get to my spot and can I be under control with my feet underneath me, my mm -hmm. hands inside, my, my, you know, my, my body height, my hip height correct? Can I get there under control before you get there? Because I want to stay on rhythm and you want to stay on rhythm, right? So if, if you want to play this, if you want to run this play again, I think he's going against Shaq Barrett here. So Shaq yeah. goes inside and, and all that really happens is, you know, he does, Brady does a good job generally, right? Um, why does he get pushed back? Well, because defensive linemen want to smell your breath before they make moves, which just means they want to get into your elbows and get into your armpits, get into your chest. Okay. So what you want to do is be able to play with good arm extension. You see Brady doesn't even win with that outside hand and that inside hand's not extended. So he's letting that person come close to his chest. You look at the second one here. He's doing a much better job of trying to get those arms extended and getting those arms extended. Again, that just gives you recovery time. Mm -hmm. That's what makes this game as far as if you want to just, yeah, yeah, we can watch this one. So first of all, let's stop. Pause yeah, it there. Here it is. He's right okay. over here. So there's a couple of things that are like interesting. If we really want to get down to the, the details of this position, when you have the, it, most people kind of stand with their feet like this, like nobody really stands like this. Okay. You kind of forced to do that. Like a lot of people just naturally their, their toes go out a little bit. Yeah. The further you're that, his left foot, the further your back foot goes like this, like the further it goes over towards the sideline, the easier it is for me to open you up. The easier for it is for me to turn as a defensive player, to turn the offensive tackle towards the sideline, because now I can't use my posterior chain. My posterior chain is like my hamstrings, my glutes, my lower back. It's the strongest part of my body. And if I turn that heel, I'm basically shutting down my glute. I can't, I can't operate it. I'm not as strong. It's like, if I was to push a car, I'm not going to push a car with my feet pointed opposite directions, right? We yeah. push a car like this. Mm -hmm. Well, it's the same kind of concept. The, the more you turn your body, the easier it is to turn your hips. And it just makes the game a little bit more difficult. You see a lot of guys do it, but a lot of guys are doing it because maybe they have poor ankle mobility. Like at some point back 20 years ago, 
there was a guy who had really bad ankle mobility and the coach, cause they didn't know what to do. were like, ah, I think this is a good idea. We'll just call this a kickstand and we'll let you put your toes to the sidelines. So, but if you want to play this, if you want to play this out, you see how he leans into the play. Now Shaq Barrett's not a big guy, but he yeah. has his hands down at his thighs. We're talking about Brady. He has his hands down in his thighs. He leans into Shaq Barrett. He kind of catches him helmet and chest to, to helmet and chest. That's right. So right there, that's not a great position, okay? Mm -hmm. Because you're not activating your posterior chain. He should be sitting back with that no numbers mentality, meaning I don't want Shaq to get a direct shot at my numbers. Yeah. And I want to punch and extend. And I'm punching a little bit with my glutes. So I'm rocking my hips forward and I punch from chest down to pop out and lock out here. When I lock out, again, I'm extending him away. I'm getting him off balance. I snap his ne neck back. It's like the Bruce Lee one-inch punch, right? I have power behind that. It's like a really hard jab. And it keeps a guy like Shaq Barrett from being able to try to come up and underneath with his club or his push under my armpit. Now, how you how do you compensate with the arm, or the arm length thing? Because Matt Rule talked about when you have the longer arms as a tackle, you, you can keep them off you and not so close. And what kind of what Brady's doing here is he's the guy is getting into his chest with the longer arms. You can kind of keep that away. What do you, how do you compensate that? I know I, I, I think Fitterer talked about footwork and stuff like that. And, um, but what, what do you do to, you know, compensate the, the, the shorter arms? Well, footwork's the easy answer for sure. But if you look at this, like <laughs> The fact that Shaq Barrett's in his chest has nothing to do with his arm length right there. It's that his body position is not very good, right? He's gotcha. bent over at the waist. He's not a hip bend. He's not a hip bender. That's the issue. The issue is not, you know, it's, it's it's a lot. If you're in the right body position and you extend your arm, if the other guy tries to get up, then you can, you know, you're working from out here. So I can wipe elbows. I can attack elbows and wipe arms off. Yeah. But if they're chest to chest, it doesn't matter how long my arms are. Why don't we look at this one? This was, I don't, I think this was a design run. I'm not sure. Uh, this was the replay. Does that does that stance look different to you? He look he definitely I think so. He's squared up. His eyes are different, right? Like this yep. is a tell. And I know we run RPOs now, so it's a little bit you know there's a little bit different. But like the reality is, if you're if you're a defensive lineman, if I'm the three technique, I guess I probably know you're coming down and blocking me. Like you just made my game the day a lot easier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he definitely looks more. Um, what's the word for balance? Square, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah square yeah. it up. Yeah. So, so great job initially. You always want to keep your feet moving and try to keep your helmet like kind of at, when you're down blocking. You're you're trying to go in for the crease of the neck, but generally a good job. And again, he extends his arms there, and he's in a good position, isn't he? And I don't know. So those are these are these are the plays where there's a difference between winning and holding on, right? That last one, yeah. that last one with Shaq Barrett. There's a difference between winning and holding on, and right there he's holding on. And that's just because, again, when you allow somebody to get into your body because you're not getting to your position under control, right? You don't have your arms extended. You are hoping that the quarterback gets rid of the ball. You are not dominating that confrontation. And the mentality has to be, I'm going to dominate the confrontation because my preparation has put me in a position to be successful. I feel super confident in, in, in my hands and my footwork. That, you know, this this is more of, I I hope he doesn't run the wheel on me. Yeah. And now he's he's facing Vita Vea here. I mean, that, <laughs> he's tough, a big right? dude, man. Yeah, big <laughs> man. This is tough ass for a rookie, but I felt like he held his own here. I mean, he's battling, he's battling with the arms. Listen, Vita Vea threw J Jason Kelsey on the floor like he was, you know, like a, a 20 cent rag doll. And I mean, and listen, Jason Kelsey is like one of my favorite players, but he's this guy's ridiculous kinds of power. Yeah. So, you know, again, when you look at this body position, I would just, I, I always look at two things when I look at offensive linemen just to start. Are, is your stance putting you in a position to be successful? Like, is your hip height and, and you're loading your hips in a position to like deliver as much power as possible? And then is your stagger one where you're not tipping every play, we can go kind of every direction, but you can get to where you need to get to in your pass protection. And so, like, if you want to dramatically improve Brady Christensen, you know, on day one, get his stance right. You know, day one. I mean, it's, it's, it doesn't sound – I know a lot of people go, oh, the, it's 
It's not that even coaches don't really coach this, but it's a monster deal. Like we spend with my guys, man, we spend time on this because it really matters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I had a, I, I talked to a pretty good source with Brady and, um, you know, the guy told me, he said, he, cause there's a, there's a lot of question marks with this offensive line this off season deservedly. So, I mean, there were statistically not, if not the worst offensive line in the league, there were so many shuffling around at like 12 different combinations. Yeah. That's tough. Um, right. But the, this person told me, you know, they feel like Brady's better suited at tackle. He can mm -hmm. make the switch to guard if he's got to, but he would like a, you know, a full off season with, training at that position instead of moving all around and i yeah. know matt rule likes the position flexibility might be his favorite word besides process and it's tough on an offense alignment and you can speak to this more than i can but when you're moving all around there's no continuity whatsoever and that's and it, for a guy who's a rookie that's tough that's that's a hard ask yeah the, the switching especially you know switching sides and having to learn both i think long term like the, here's the thing i you whether you like Matt Rule or not, right? And I, I don't, I don't pay too much attention to what's said in the, in the papers. But, and I think he said something about like Jay Z was a seven year overnight sensation or something. He said <laughs> yes. something to that effect, right? So the <laughs> timeline is not what seven I, years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the timeline is not, maybe not what you want. But here's the deal: like you have to build up, you have to develop a program. Like it doesn't. And I think you probably had the wrong hire with Joe Brady. I think at, at this point it's obvious. But you have to develop your culture. You have to develop your program. You have to – I mean, you might not like to hear about process, but if they don't have a process by the way that you do things – like you remember Pete Carroll when he first got to Seattle? Pete Carroll's process was, hey, listen, SC works pretty good, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to go – we're going to acquire people that want to make a difference in the game, not guys that just want to have a nice career, but guys who, like Earl Thomas who, said, who walked in and said, oh, I'm going to be a Hall of Famer. Cam Chancellor, oh, I want to change the way safety positions played, right? Richard Sherman, yeah. I want to be the best corner in the game. Like they wanted, they wanted that. They're hungry for it. They went and identified those players and then they played them early. And their whole thing was, we're going to use the college model and we're going to, we're going to play and develop these guys. And it might be ugly for a while, but we're going to get into this process. We're going to draft them. We're going to play them. We're going to teach them while they're playing. And in a couple of years from now, you guys are going to like what we see. And obviously, well, I think that's I think the not that's been the knock on Matt Rule is he drafts these guys, and this team struggled all year. And yeah. the fans' gripe was, why don't you play some of these young guys? It would have been better off to see yeah. Brady Christensen from week one and see his progression to week eighteen than having Cam Irving start and look as bad as a rookie would. So, like, <laughs> and I think that's that's the gripe about you know. Yeah, and De we haven't even talked Deontay Brown too, another rookie guard yeah. who had, was stellar at Alabama. And, you know, the guy saw a couple plays week 18. And I know he was battling some weight issues and stuff like that. And I think he had an injury this year, but it's, you know. My weight issues, that's, that's what Ron like did too. Pounds, right? What's that? And that's what Ron Rivera did too back a couple years ago when yeah. – his second season, I mean, he was playing these young guys. They strung together four or five wins at the end of the year, and you had some promise going into next year and something to build off of. It was just tough when you got a guy you draft in the third round, you don't have a left tackle that's doing his job, and he could have been at least, you know, trial by fire and learning along the way. And I think that's been the big knock. You never cool. know what's going on in the background, right, in the meetings that's with the owner. You, yep. you, you just never know. And I, I remember I had an executive tell me, he was explaining how, you know, we went to the playoffs the first year. So he used that equity to go make some pretty risky decisions the second year in hopes that he could get his job continued the third year. Like it was like everything is some, sometimes based, depending on who you're talking to, on just like, can I get this next year on like, or are they going to fire me? And so yeah. I don't know what the motivations are, but, you know, if you come in and you're, you're famous for turning around programs, then I don't know what that timeline looks like, but certainly – you would think that if he's preaching that, hey, we have a process, we have a turnaround process, this is what I'm a master at, you would certainly think that if you're going to draft these guys, you'd play them because you, mm -hmm. you, know, you don't have a quarterback. You don't. There's a lot of pieces on your offense that are missing. You have a great defense. Like This defense deserved better than, than, than what they got oh, from yeah. a record standpoint. Absolutely. I totally agree with you. And they've invested a lot in the defense. Um, and, you know, at, at points in this season, they've struggled at times. Um, but I think they've they finally got something built. 
um, some roots in the ground a little bit. And yeah. I think they can build on that. I, th- I mean, there's still holes. I mean, there's no doubt about it, but I mean, there's holes on every team. I mean, what would make- you say the identity identity of this offense is? Cause I mean, really like it, no it one does, knows. Yeah. No one knows. And it starts there. Do you think the players know though? And this is what is lost sometimes. Cause we're all sitting here as, as outside the building going, what the hell are they doing in the building? And I, I'm not speaking for anybody in that building. I haven't been there in a while. But I just know these I, – I've been in enough organizations where you can walk in and go, hey, what's your identity? What do you, what do you guys do? And they'll just kind of like look down on the ground, look at their feet, shuffle around a little bit because they don't really have an identity because they mm. don't know who their quarterback is because they don't know what kind of system they want to run. Those two quarterbacks are completely different in the offensive schemes that, that they've found success in, whether it was in college or, or in the NFL in the case of Cam. And they, don't, they have a couple guys that look like they can make plays at wide receiver. They don't you – know, they, they just don't have these pieces where you go – I'm absolutely going to lean on this. When things get bad, I'm going to go to this guy or this guy. And, and this is the kind of team we want to be run, play action, quick screen, whatever yeah. it is. It's like you can't be a master of everything, you know, unless your yeah. name's Tom Brady. Yeah. And I think, honestly, I think the Joe Brady hire was, is not something Matt Rule really wanted to do, just as a sense from it just seems like his. Joe Brady's philosophy as an offense compared to what Matt Rule, I think, wants was just not on the same page whatsoever at all. And I think with this new hire and Ben McAdoo, and we I haven't even we haven't even discussed this really on the podcast because it happened this week, but I feel like he fits more of that Matt Rule mold of what he envisions in an offense. And he interviewed the first time around. They just didn't pull the trigger on him. And I don't know if that was, you know, some pressure from up above upper management and the owner to say, Hey, let's, let's go after this young uprising coming from Sean Payton system had a really good year in college at LSU with Joe Burrow and chase and, you know, Marshall and all those guys. And then that offense looked great. And then Joe, Joe comes to Carolina and it, I just, I don't think him and Matt rule saw eye to eye at all. It's, it seems that way, and I can't. I can tell you from experience that depending on who your owner is and the input that they want to have, and listen, I, I've I've been in buildings where we'll 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 hire a, a big name free agent because they like the way they interviewed on TV, like the owner liked the way they interviewed uh, on TV, or we'll hire uh, we hire a head coach. You know, it's like I always go back to uh, – I don't even want to get into that. But you know, we'll, we'll make decisions based on what the owner wants. And the owner is most more often than not not involved in day-to-day operations. So you don't really know. You know, it's like you want to be – It's what if Mr. Miyagi said, you do karate down the left side of the road, okay, right side of the road, okay. Karate down the middle, squish like grape. Like there, there's no halfway crooks. Yeah. If you want to be part of the decision-making process as the owner, you have the right to do that. But if you want to be successful – you either show up and do the day-to-day so you know what the culture is in the building or stay out of the way, right? Write the mm-hmm. check. Just be happy. Mm-hmm. Just be, be, Otherwise, if you start making, hey, I, I kind of want to bring this 32-year-old wonder kid in because he seems really smart. It's like what we're finding out now is Joe Burrow is really smart and Joe Burrow is carrying a franchise on his back right now. You know, <laughs> you know without without uh, an offensive line, they just, they just got his best friend from college to show up. He's like, hey, we're going to go to the AFC Championship. Like yeah. nothing else changed. It's not you know, Zach Zach Taylor, who was was a great guy, smart guy. He was like two and fourteen his first year. What's changed? Did they change the offense? No, man. Joe Burrow is unique. They yeah. said yesterday on tape, and he didn't. He doesn't even need to take notes. He's got a photographic memory. You're like, so there, you can't explain that away. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, let's 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 go to more Brady here. Um, we saw that play. Um, some of these are tough to see from so far away. Um, but here he is. Here's a good one. This is where he's – I mean, he's taking on – So it's a double read, right? So they're, they're – Yeah, they're he's got – it looks like Vita Vea and then um, – let me play this through here if I can find it. I think it's Vita Vea and maybe Barrett coming off the side, but it's, t- it's, it's yep. tough to so, see here. So – they have everybody mugged up, right? And so what happens is you have to scat read, which means the left guard and the left tackle are going to basically be – you're going to take the two most dangerous players. And so he does a good job of vertical setting on Vita Vea and understanding that he might have to come back down to Vita if the, if the B gap or the A gap rusher comes, 
Or mm-hmm. you might have to go out to Shaq Barrett late and just kind of push him by. And this is where this is kind of being savvy more so than really I'm focusing on like how good is your footwork and whatnot. This is just being yeah. a savvy guy, understanding if he is doing him a favor by lining up in a four technique right over him, so he can just kind of go straight back and put his hand on him and then come off late if he has to when he when he feels that left guard bump. Right. This is actually much, much harder, for example. If Vita Vea goes down to a three technique, rushes that B gap really hard, and he's forced to kind of step down now and then pop back out. So this is a um, this is something that happens a lot in the NFL as mm-hmm. far as the way that we have to read protections. And if it ever all goes well, as a casual fan, you'll never notice, but it's a really, really hard thing to do. Well, yeah, like when you see plays like this out of him, this is where it's like, man, this guy can – he could really pass protect here and gives you somewhat of hope that, you know, this guy could be a left, ta- uh, you know, a, an elite left tackle someday if he's doing stuff like this. Cause these guys, I mean, these are top tier, you know, Barrett and Vita Vea, these are top defenders in the league. And he's, he's got, he's, he's got a lot of imp- uh, holes to fix and, you know, improve on that you've already mentioned. But I think you see the one you just, things, you just, you see that one right there that you just showed? This is so because from a from a, a coach's standpoint or from a football fan aficionado standpoint, the bottom line is can you win your one-on-one matchup? Like your only value as a player really is can you win your one-on-one matchup? Mm-hmm. And so right here, if you watch this, he wins. He doesn't allow himself to turn inside. He extends that inside arm, right? And keeps that that good like mechanical chain between his right foot and his right hand extended right so his hips uh-huh. engaged this is a this doesn't seem like a big deal that's a big deal play because what he's just said is that defensive end you're not going to take the b gap on me like you're not going to blow rush me inside which yeah. is the shortest distance to the quarterback so those it's those kind of plays that i get you know, if i'm a, if i'm a fan of the of the panthers or if i'm a coach that's looking to okay what can we do with this guy i'm going Okay, this is something we can build on. He has the confidence that comes with like understanding how that feels when you get it right. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, and that's uh, that's re- one reason why I picked this play out. I thought he held his own, took care of business, and he—I mean, I get it; it's away from the play, but he's still—I mean, it's a—it's a big time block for a rookie. So. Well, it's only away. From, it's only away from the play because he gets he gets flushed, right? Like like yeah. that's a that's that's just a drop. That Darnold, that's, did, I think that's Darnold. Yeah, looks like Darnold. Yeah. And then we got one more here from this Tampa Bay game, I think. I think this is – back that up a little bit. Oops. Now he got – he let him inside there. He turned him. One more time. Um, let's see here. Looks like the guy gets inside. I mean, okay, the play so was kind of dead. But. So you see what happens there, and this is what we're talking about. It's so easy to get his body turned towards the sideline. And once your body gets turned towards the sideline, you have that wide base. It's imagine you really open up like the hands of a clock. Like imagine there, like his left foot is basically in the center of a, of a watch. And it's just easy to open him up like this because your base is too wide. Your hips are towards, turned towards the sideline. And you have your, your inside hand is on the outside of, of the defender. So that means – probably his the defender's inside hand is on your chest, right? So it's just – it's those kind of things where you have to be manic on working that inside hand back in, getting that getting that uh, inside arm off with at the elbow and then fighting for position. Let's go to the second game. I had the Saints one up, but let's let's just – just for time's sake, mm-hmm. we'll go to the se- second Tampa Bay game here. This one is all I – fi- I got the all 22 on this one, so this should be some pretty good – we can see a little bit better where he's happy. This is, excuse me. There we go. That's the right one. So yeah, this is second time Carolina played Tampa Bay. This is week 18. So this is his, technically his fourth start at left tackle. Cause he started, he started midway through the season out in one game, I believe. Um, but this was, this is third start in a row. So, and he's, you know, he's faced these guys two weeks prior. So, mm-hmm. athletically, you just want to stay up. Say that again. I said, athlete from an athletic standpoint, just when when he hits the sky, you want to keep your feet running. You don't want to fall down. Right. 
Like he's too tall yep. right there. You see what I mean? So he's he's got bad leverage. And remember we talked about before he like this even the stance like the natural def, the natural default for him is to stand up, and so that's where it becomes a problem with like leverage points, especially when you're you're rising to the second level of those linebackers. This is one of my favorite plays of his, and it, it might not be a lot, but it mm-hmm. shows he's continuing. You'll see in a little bit he continues through the play, and even if he touches this guy a little bit, he's helping out the running back here on the screen. It's not much, but just to get in the guy's way there on that play. That's so that, yeah, that's the, he does that by design. That's it. That's everything he did there is by design. That's a design play. So he he's he's supposed to show on the defensive end, and they're just going to win the reel with a quick screen because they think that mm-hmm. fifty one is going to bite, and they they just basically think they have leverage on him, and they and they think that I don't know if that's who that is. that's not Shaq Barrett. I don't know who that defensive end is. They're basically just saying Darnold can throw it over that guy and there's nobody else because they've run the quick slant on the left side and bring that mm-hmm. corner and they're in man coverage. See what I mean? Yep. No, I got you. Good athleticism. And this one he so gets This is what beat. we're talking about. Yeah. yeah. So this is what we're talking about just from – okay, so watch your – what's the most important things? Your stance, your initial footwork, and body height, right? Yep. So from and he's, his, he's stance, launching at this guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got to be able to kind of throttle down, go inside out here, win with your hands. See the crossover. Yep. And then listen, this happens like I, this happened a ton. Of, like it happens to everybody, right? Yep. It's just when you're young, it happens more often. And the way that you run out on this guy, like you're, it's like you're a dog chasing a car. You don't know what you're going to do when you get there, right? And mm-hmm. so. You have to be able to take that first two steps hard to sell it. Now the guy's going to want to butt you up. Now you shoot your hands inside, settle down, you know, get tight, get locked in with those hands, drop your hips, and now you can just play ball. But he has everything he wants. He's just out of control, right? His, his aiming point's too far away from the quarterback. Mm-hmm. See, there I thought he did a good this, – this looks way more controlled on this play here. So I mean, just because he almost lost it at one yeah. point with the hands, but and yeah. then he, you know, he resets, and it looks like I can pull this back up here. So I'm not a huge. I'm just not a huge fan of of the way he's. He this is the last one. I'm not a huge fan of that set because it's so it's so diagonal. It's easy to win inside outside. It's easy gotcha. to get to your confront. You get to your confrontation point kind of out of control, and you see that that. Yeah, and the, he's kind of stumbling back. The, the, de- the defensive end actually wins the initial confrontation. He just starts wrestling with him, and he has inside help with that left guard. But if he set back instead of setting so at that 45, you get to your same spot, but the angle of departure for that defensive end is a yes. little bit different, that angle of confrontation. You see his – look, anytime you see your right arm outside your phone booth, like imagine you have a British phone booth that you're standing yep. in. When your right out arms – That's your inside arms outside your phone booth – that you're not going to win with it. And if you don't win with your inside of hand, it's usually how you get into trouble. Yeah. Now, guys, here's the thing about playing uh, NFL level left tackle. You could wrestle with a guy 50 plays during a game and not lose, right? Mm-hmm. You might lose three of them. Mm-hmm. Problem is you might lose three of them, right? What yeah. we want to do is that's what we talk about winning, not holding on. So interesting play there, um, just because you're not sure what he's doing, just the way that they enter into, into that double. Yeah. You know what I mean? It looks like there's some kind of mis- – okay, so it's an RPO. It's really tough with the NFL now with RPOs because you got to remember linemen can't go downfield. Yep. So in like this situation, the guard is kind of – you kind of have to stay attached to that three technique, and they're kind of going into it slower than they want because they can't release to that linebacker. Yeah, that RPO, it, they are in a tough freaking spot with that. Yeah, like right now, 73, if he doesn't run, if he throws that ball, 73 is illegal man downfield. Yep. Is that Michael yeah, Jordan? Oh, yeah. He's a beauty. That's a great name. <laughs> <clears throat> One more time. On the backside, I always look for, did you gain leverage with your initial footwork? So your right foot, did you gain leverage? Oops. 
He doesn't, right? No. And it's it's something that's learned. It's just understanding where to put mental weight on, on in your stance, right? But you have to gain leverage against good players. Uh, again, just because so when he steps, the- where I, I don't know, can you see this uh, pointer that I got here? The mouse. Can you see the no. mouse on your screen? Oh, you can. Okay. No. Never mind. Then I would say, where but, do but you want to see? It, yeah. So it just it, to make it as easy as possible, just draw a line down his right foot, right? Like straight down the field from end zone to end zone, yep. down his right foot. You want to, if you're gaining leverage, like, you know, if I'm gaining leverage, I want to step like this. I want to gain leverage. Like, so if there's a line going like this. I want to gain leverage here. I'm gaining leverage on my opponent. I'm getting closer to where I want to be on that opponent versus right here. I don't step at all. Or a lot of guys do what? They just step behind themselves. And there's a whole explanation of why that's like the death sentence for offensive linemen, but Mm -hmm. maybe for another day. So you know what I see? I'm just going to make a real general statement because I know this guy's a, a, you know, a tw- I think he's an older rookie, right? He's BYU. He's probably like 25 years old. Yeah, I think so. I believe that's right. Yeah. So what I see here is a guy that can play NFL football that is not very refined. Like he's, he's a pretty good athlete. Mm-hmm. And, it, and I don't know how physical he is. Like I don't know if he's a physical enough guy to play guard. I don't know if his bend and his body height are, are the kind – like that position right there, that is not a football position for, for an offensive lineman. Your feet are wide. You're tall. Your hands are too, like outside your cylinder. Like that is – and we caught it. You caught it on a bad frame maybe, but that is not how you want to look. Yeah. Right? And so, and so you just have to go, all right, how – what am I, What are we going to do to develop this guy? Is he going to – like does he have a private coach that's making him better? Do they have a new line coach that's really going to be a fundamental teacher of technique? Like, if if you make him a good technician, he'll be a good player because he's a good enough athlete. Well, and see, I'm glad you're talking about this because as a fan, and I think this is where a lot of fans get caught off. As a fan, you're the pro here on what an offensive lineman should be doing. As a fan, I look at this play, and I, to me, it looks like he, he did well. Like, at, I don't know all the techniques and everything, but for him, it's like, okay, he held his own um, – and, but when you break it down technique wise, I mean, you're saying it, and I think this is kind of what Matt rule is seeing and saying to a lot of people when they're, well, why isn't this guy playing all, you know, more is, I mean, you're, you're saying he's right, right off the jump. He's too wide. His hands are way out here. Um, and as a fan, I'm, we don't, we don't see some of that stuff. So I'm glad you're, I'm glad you're mentioning that. Well, it's, it's, and it doesn't make the thing is it's not a death sentence. Yeah. You, you know, it just it just means you have to sharp technique. And look, I was I came from an option offense in, in from Navy when I got into the league. Like I literally didn't know how to get in the stance. So I'm telling you from experience that the becoming a master technician in this game will completely change the game. The question now is, given how old he is, given the situation, given that there's that there's there's such a, a fluid there's so the the reshuffling of the offensive staff is fluid. We don't know kind of the, what they're going to run, how they're going to run, what the demeanor is. Mm-hmm. It's up to him. It's up to the athlete to own. This is your career, man. Like you can yep. make a gazillion dollars, be a hero, do live out your dream, but you better go find somebody that is going to teach you how to do this the right way. Because I would be based on what they had this year, his rookie year, they fired their O-line coach. They fired their offensive coordinator. I would be sitting there going, I don't know if I trust that they're going to bring in somebody to make me the player that I need to be. Mm-hmm. That's what I always get worried about with these guys now because they're probably going to go hire their buddy. Yeah, it, it, I, from what I've been told that he he's going to probably be training. I don't know if you know this guy, but Duke Mannyweather. Yeah, he's Duke's a, good. Yeah, I, from what I was told, he's going to be working with him this offseason. Um, and then doing some training back home as well. But, I mean, hopefully you talk about the techniques. Hopefully he can brush some of that stuff up. But it's tough, too, because they, he doesn't know if they're going to try to slide him into guard. And I feel like – and I've heard this before about him that he – I forgot what you the word you used before, but he's not – I don't know if it was aggressive as a guard or um, – He's just not physical enough. Physical enough. Thank you. So that – and that's been – I've heard a – 
you know, I know the guys that four man rush, we've had Kevin on a couple of times on our podcast and he's, he's mentioned that last time we had him on was that too. So that's something that's tough for him too. Cause you go training in the off season and he doesn't know if he's playing tackle guard. I don't think he's going to know until the draft comes. Cause yeah, but it's a, it's a, it's a mentality thing. Like you saw, you watched the games last night. You saw Trent Williams, right? Yep. I know he's different. Like I, I get that he's different, but he is as physical a lineman that there is in the game, and he plays left tackle. Like it's just a mentality. We've we've kind of we've kind of trained ourselves to think that the tackle can be this almost um, graceful a- athlete, right? That just yeah. has this really unique skill set. Whereas they can be super physical. It's only going to help them. A lot of good tackles, John Ogden, Tunsil, they start they play him a series they play him a season at left guard to understand the physicality of the game. Mm-hmm. right and understand the speed of the game and then they put them back out of their natural position and they flourish oh, that's a good point that's a really good point here he is vita vea mm-hmm. yeah i mean he like you know you just go physically he can get the job done against these guys you know again it's it's always hard when you watch we can kind of make clips look how they want right yeah so if you know if you just go, can can he hold up against Vita Veil on a seven step drop when he holds the ball for three seconds? I don't know. You know, in that position, you know, probably not ten out of ten times, but like right there, he does a pretty good job of getting turned and then coming back and recovering and mm-hmm. getting his hips into the defender. Like that that stuff, that athletic part of the game is something that is probably why they you know he got drafted. He's got yeah. that that stuff to him. It's just a question of teaching the technique. This was him getting out. I don't know if he really blocks anyone here, does he? And he gets in the way a little bit. That's really about it. Well, when you're listen, when you're 300 plus and the guy you're going against is 200 minus, 200 go, pound quarter. Just yeah, just man, just get out of my way, please. Don't make me look silly. Kind of having a hard time seeing the seeing it fluid, um, just because of the yeah, area. it's so grainy sometimes. Okay, so one more time. I said it's this video is grainy sometimes. Oh, no, just show this show this play because I think this is an interesting. So he starts with a B, right backside B, double team with a guard, and he does a great job. And this is like this is football IQ. He does a great job of coming back and saying, "I'm going to now double with the tight end." on the defensive end. You see he steps to the guard. He steps towards the guard and then comes back mm-hmm. and takes over that second block. That's a, that's a big-time play. Those are little things that you don't see, but, like, a coach will spend – that's an entire session. Like, we got to make sure we can do this because that might be a yeah. big play in the game, right? The thing about offensive and defensive line plays, it's not always going to happen exactly how you want. So you have to mm-hmm. go in and have a process that makes sense, right? So you can you have something new that's that's replicable, yeah, right? Because otherwise, you're learning something new every single snap. And if you learn like <laughs> in an NFL game, is not a, is not a time to be in learning mode. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, I got you. See this one, he just gets. I felt like the Panthers score here if he blocks. Is it 96 right here? If he yeah. blocks 96 down right, because they're they're gonna throw a, they're gonna throw um the the Travis Kelsey pitch in the inside coming up yeah. here, and the guy he was he the guy he was supposed to block makes a tackle. I think yeah. Sometimes we overcommit on these kind of blocks because you think you have the momentum all of a sudden, but don't understand that the athlete that you're blocking is better athlete than you are. So it's yeah, like you, just you almost want right to you almost want to attack one two three. And then kind of settle, get those hips into him, and so he can't roll out of it, right? Instead of just mm-hmm. trying to like commit and drive him down the side, when all the guy has to do is spin out of it. That's just that's just a again. We just talk about like this is experience stuff. This isn't you probably he's playing in college. You probably just go ahead and drive that guy to the sideline, but it just doesn't work that way in the NFL. Yeah. So what what are your thoughts? Just seeing Brady, um, you think. I mean, I know it's it's so early to tell, but what do you see from him? What do you what's the positives, kind of the negatives on his, you know, the film on him and just kind of overview of what he is at the tackle position? 
Yeah, so I, I think, you know, it's all it's all context, but, you know, he's 25. I think he's 25 or 26 years old. So he's already kind of, even though he's a rookie, you're kind of like, man, he's a little bit down the road as far as where some other people are going to be at this point. Mm-hmm. Um, there's nothing we can do about that now. It's kind of a sunk cost. So you're moving forward, if you get, you know, this is, this is why, honestly, not self-promoting, but this is why I'm in the business I'm in. Yeah. Because – there you see guys like this, and they're like, he he's got enough athleticism to play. He probably has the desire to play, but he doesn't have the tool set to be successful right now. And mm-hmm. and number one, the way we start in, with everything when developing athletes is you start with technique mm-hmm. because there's so many things you can learn off of technique. You know, we talk about professionalism, attention to detail, commitment to the cause. You can learn all of that stuff yeah. just by really hyper focusing on your movement patterns your, your, and your decision making. And so I, you know, I think that you have somebody that can go play the sport. Is he gonna? Does he need to get a little bit more explosive, more powerful, or at least need to learn how to harness that power that he has already inside him? Absolutely. Just I think working technique, spending an offseason, really finding somebody that he can get better with, makes a huge difference in that guy's game next year. Now, if folks want, they're interested in process to perform. What does that process look like? You just you go online, or what? What? How do you get things rolling? If they want to, oh yeah, hit, part of yeah, that. yeah. You, you hit me up at process. Uh, hit me up on on anywhere. DM me at Mike Wall sixty eight on Twitter. Uh, process to perform on Instagram. You go to process to perform You can we can we can uh, set up like a breakthrough session. Start talking about your athlete. If you're a parent, or obviously if you're if you're a pro guy, just hit me up, and, and that's how we get we we get started. We just now. Do you get a lot of clients out of high school, or you got are you working more with college? college guys or is it kind of um, like usually, well it, it just depends on the season right um and, and like right now like i just said i'm i'm not focused as much on on the athletes right now as i am on on coaches and coaching staffs and mm-hmm. and working on kind of making sure because this is the kind of the issue like the next issue is or not issue but the opportunity is getting really good coaching staffs that are attend because they spend the most time with the athletes so it's like let's try to make sure that they understand the movement patterns behind pass protection. So they're not teaching this guy to open his hips up on the, on the third kick. And let's make sure we have the attention to detail every day when they'll get caught in a rut and forget to go through all this stuff, right? Let's get our culture right. So um, I I've dealt with, you know, I got high school guys that are now in college. I have college, college guys that are, that are trying to go into the pro. I got, you know, 13 year olds that are going on 14. It just, doesn't really matter um, in any any sport, any confrontational sport. It's not I, I, for me. It's not just related to football. It's any confrontational sport that requires skill and requires t- dedicated time to get better. We can mm. make you a lot better. And be real quick, we got to talk about the, to this tonight's or this afternoon and tonight's games. We got L.A. and Tampa Bay playing at mm-hmm. three o'clock, and then it's Kansas City and Buffalo for the night game. What what are you thinking? Who do you got for picks wise? I know it's yesterday didn't turn out with the way you wanted it. Yeah, I don't. <laughs> God, nobody listened to me. But I, you know, I, I've kind of switched my mind that I think the Bills might pull it out tonight just because it, they look so good. And I thought maybe Josh Allen can't replicate that again, but they did look so good. And the Chiefs have this history of just like starting slow. And I don't know if you can start slow with the Bills if the Bills are going to come out and score a ton of points mm-hmm. in the Tampa game. I, I think you're a fool to ever bet against Tom Brady. Um, and so I'm not going to bet against him, but I like the I I really like the the Tampa Bay defense. And that's really probably why I'm, I'm I'm pro Tampa Bay right now. They got all their guys back. They look amazing on uh, on the defensive line and their box players mm-hmm. with those two linebackers that they have. I just think they're a really solid team. So I, I would go Tampa. Um, I think earlier in the week I probably would have gone Chiefs, but after last night and seeing what happened with Green Bay and being depressed as I am, I probably just go with the Bills. Yeah, I know a lot of Panther fans are rooting for uh, Carolina North because there's a lot of guys from. The Panthers on the on the Buffalo. Yeah, Bill. I mean, after after yep. management and coaching staff is from there, it's sad to see them. Them guy. I mean, it's cool, but it sucks for us because we kind of got screwed out of it. But yeah, I think I just think Stafford when he, when it comes time to the big game, I just don't. I think he struggles. So I mean, it's today will be a good test to see if he can you know win in the playoffs. Um, Cause this is new territory. I think the lions went maybe once or twice with him in Detroit, but he just seems erratic at times and yeah. turning the ball over when it, when it comes to the big game. And I, I'm not betting against Tom Brady. I, I don't want the bucks to win NFC South, but I think they, I think they win today. And I, I like Kansas city, man. I think it's going to be, I think Kansas city might go to the bowl again. I really do. I think there's no reason. There's no reason not to bet against them. 
<laughs> right. But Buffalo, they I mean you're you're right. They've been playing well. I just yeah. They're kind of they're kind of up and down. You'll get a really good game out of them and then the next week they they look like, you know, they're losing to New England and New England throws the ball five times in one game. So it'll be interesting. It was good games yesterday and there'll be I'm sure there's going to be some great ones today. So I'm excited. But Mike, thank you so much for coming on. I appreciate it. Former Panthers pro bowler and all pro guard. Um and process to perform. Go check them out. That's process to the number two perform.com. Mike's got a great program. He works with all ages. Doesn't matter the sport. So go check him out. And it's just always a pleasure to get you on, Mike. Yeah, thanks for having me. All right. Talk to you later. Good luck to all the teams out there today. Go check us out on Panthers on Tap on Twitter. Also, you can um, check out our podcast wherever you get them. Apple Music, Spotify, we got them everywhere. So go listen. I think we're going to take a few weeks off here. Need to recollect our thoughts. I know the Ben McAdoo hire, a lot of people are fired up about that. But we will be back in a couple of weeks. But again, thank you guys for listening and enjoy football today.